Ladies and gentlemen, your friend from South Africa, it's a great honor and a great pleasure to welcome you here at uh, Vision URL on the occasion of this uh, focus uh, section of our festival devoted to the cinema of a country constantly developing in fields such as culture, society and economics. The idea of the focus was uh, born seven uh, years ago. According to the aim of uh, Vision Sud-Est fund that uh, Vision du Réel uh, is a part of, its purpose uh, uh, was to explore the documentary production of countries from uh, south and east of the world. Before you, several production companies from uh, Colombia, Bosnia Herzegovina, Lebanon, Tunisia, Georgia, and Chile have uh, successfully planned their strategies here. The geographic choice uh, is motivated uh, by the mission that uh, links, or the vision also, that links the, our festival with the activity of the Swiss uh, Agency for Development and uh, Cooperation, part of the Federal Develop Department of Foreign Affairs, that is represented here by its uh, uh, Deputy Director, P.O. Venupst, and the head of the culture and development team, Geraldine Zoyner. The main aim of this collaboration is to showcase uh, uh, the cinema industry of these countries, dedicated to the documentary productions, supporting local, local companies in order to allow them to be better structured on the international level. We have three main action in order to achieve this goal. The first one is to highlight the films of the guest country through uh, the best possible exhibition in the festival program. The second one is to invite the producers and directors in order to allow them to have the best international networking possible. The third one is to organize this co-production meeting uh, entitled Fox Talk that will put you in contact and the producer and the directors of this uh, documentary, five documentary projects with several possible European co-producers. We add to these three action a fourth one. Uh, the most interesting project will be awarded a grant of 10,000 Swiss francs by Vision Sudiest jury. I welcome here the three members of this jury Carlo Chatrian, director of Locarno International Film Festival, Amy Papagiorgiu, member of the selection committee and head of the press relations at Fribourg International Film Festival, and Merit Rugla, the, who represents the distributor Trigon Film. The five project presenters at the focus are Days of Cannibalism by Teboko Hadkins, Encore by Jesse Zinn and Jethro Westrod, Life and Time of John C. by Francois Verster, Not Yet, Not Dead Yet by Arian Kaganov, and The Spirit of Karu by Engelbert Piri and Nzinzi Nekene. South African documentary production is strong since uh, quite many years and is constantly developing. It was therefore our duty to give a special attention during this 48th edition of uh, Vision du Réel. The focus uh, vision uh, the, for South Africa has been organized uh, thanks to the tight collaboration between uh, its coordinator, Jasmine Basic, Gudela Menzelt, head of the Doc Outlook International Market, the market coordinator, Florian Finzag, the fund uh, Vision Sudest, the National Film and Video Foundation, the Documentary Filmmakers Association, 
and the South Africa embassy in Switzerland, hoping that this uh, focus will be fruitful for all of you. I wish you a pleasant day. Thank you. So again, hello, everybody. My name is Yasmin Basic. And as Luciano said, that I'm uh, the coordinator, the manager of this focus. Uh, we have been working on this project uh, for more than one year. And this year has been very constructive, very intense. It's really uh, an adjective that I like to use because it corresponds to, to the work and to the um, exploration of uh, the uh, South African documentary creation and production, which is uh, very rich, very diverse. Uh, you have the possibility to, to see this through the 19 films that we have selected and that are screened during the festival week. And of course, as well, through the five projects that uh, Luciano just mentioned and that will be presented in the second part of this morning. Um, I've been watching more than, uh, I think, 300 films from the uh, last 15 years of uh, South African uh, documentary production. What we try to do is to give, uh, in a humble and, uh, of course, subjective uh, uh, way, uh, we wanted to give an insight, at least an insight, into this so-called documentary landscape. Of course, this selection of films is not exhaustive. This is not at all the goal. But uh, we really wanted to highlight uh, some of the uh, filmmakers, some of the languages that are used to tell uh, the stories that you have the chance to see. And the same thing, of course, for uh, the project uh, that we are already uh, looking forward to see on big screen uh, in the future edition. I have to thank very, very much uh, a lot of people, uh, directors, producers, uh, uh, institution representatives, uh, and other uh, contacts, other partners in crime that I had the chance to meet uh, in Johannesburg, uh, in Cape Town, uh, or uh, via Skype, uh, a lot of emails, uh, and uh, also a lot of people that I'm meeting here. It was... Uh, it was, um, again, an intense dive, but uh, we are really, really very, very happy about the, uh, the result. Uh, and uh, I, I really want to thank um, all the uh, professionals that helped us. Uh, uh, thank you for trusting me, for trusting my colleagues, and for trusting the, the festival. So, uh, this morning you have this uh, brochure that you can find here at the uh, entrance. You have the whole program, not only of this morning, but of the whole section um, concerning this uh, focus talk. Um, the first part of the uh, exchanges, uh, debates, conversation will take place until half past 11 and uh, we will have the possibility to um, enrich our knowledge of uh, documentary in South Africa through different contributions uh, by the NFVF, uh, by the Documentary uh, Filmmakers Association and also by other guests, uh, Jyoti Mystery and Daryl Else, that will give us the uh, opportunity also to um, explore a bit more the aesthetical and historical um, situation concerning documentary filmmaking. We'll have also, hopefully, uh, the uh, possibility to um, listen to Carlo Matabane's experience with the case study. Carlo should arrive, like some of the other guests, this morning, so uh, there's still a bit of suspense, but without suspense, this focus would be really so boring. So, um, okay. 
And um, after this uh, a break, and of course the audience will have the possibility to ask questions or to share also uh, remarks or observation. And in the second part of the morning, from uh, 11.45 to uh, 1 p.m., there will be the presentation of the five selected projects. So that's it uh, from my side. I have the pleasure to welcome here the first speaker that uh, accepted our invitation, and it is also one of the crucial partners for this focus, uh, Yolanda Nkokotwana, representing the National Film and Video Foundation, NFVF. Yolanda, welcome. You can come here. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, and thank you for having us. Um, it is an honor to be here and to showcase South African films and to showcase our culture through pictures. Um, I represent a national body called the NAVF. Our responsibility is um, funding national films and also working with other stakeholders in making sure that the South African film industry grows. Um, some of our so as, a, as an organization, I think that was set up in 2001, uh, we've been tasked with a number of, um, I suppose, objectives and from transforming the industry um, to creating national and global platforms that en enable us as South Africans to create a sustainable and a viable industry. Um, and some of our transformation goals, if you allow me just to go through them and in terms of our objectives, um, is obviously to transform and accelerate um, the production and the development of the film industry from those of uh, previously disadvantaged uh, background. As you will know with our history, South Africa has a very young democracy of about 25 years now. So we're still trying to uh, culturally and in terms of business uh, deal with the circumstances that have been left with the past. But we also understand that the globe is moving very fast and we're trying to keep abreast and uh, keep up to speed. Um, I think in terms of just understanding our funding, because we thought, uh, how do we make it relevant from you? I think we have about a few co-productions with other countries that we work with, um, just your neighbors next door, which is Germany, France, um, UK, and a few others that we work with in terms of putting together money and trying to make sure that we remain relevant and we raise money globally and also we're able to create platforms and partnerships in terms of distribution, marketing, and producing the films. Um, just to take you just in the past, I think from last year alone, between April um, until this March, the NAVF has, um, has funded about 50 productions, which are documentary. Yes, we've funded about over 100 productions, but I think it's about 50 that are relevant to you, which is documentary. We funded about 28 in terms of development, and we funded about 22 um, from production side. We also have done about four productions, which are special projects to commemorate um, the Soweto uprising, which um, happened in about 40 years ago, and the 60 years of the Women's March, uh, which was celebrating 60 years as well. Um, I think, um, if you will allow me, <laughs> um, just to talk about the opportunities that we do provide in South Africa. I think South Africa has a very vibrant landscape um, in terms of culture and storytelling. Um, South Africa also has a very strong television industry, which I think um, the filmmakers in here will agree with me that actually holds us together as an industry and I suppose create more sustainability. Um, also, we have good relationships with um, international um, companies and funders, one of them being uh, the Blue Eyes Fund, which have always dedicated and supported the South African um, film industry, as well as the Itfa Betha Fund, which constantly supports South African films and are willing to engage us and help us in terms of us developing and taking our films to the next level. Um, 
South Africa has about nine co-productions, as I had said before, and we have about six in Europe, which we're hoping, obviously, <laughs> that um, Swiss um, would be able to use because also we go, we engage in um, in tripartite in terms of the of the of the co-production. So if you're able to work with Germany, and Germany can work with us, so we don't have to work directly, but we can be. Um, we can work um, with other countries as well. And I suppose the bigger we are, the better we are, and the more money we're able to raise, especially in this genre of documentaries, which is most of the time seen as social um, films and does not always attract the money that we would like to attract from both private and, um, I suppose, state institutions. Um, just in South Africa alone, I think um, the NAVF is one of those that are sort of um, uh, that one institution that is um, stable and consistent in terms of supporting and finding filmmakers. Obviously, we do have um, a DTI which has the bigger money. I think they fund about 35% um, of the budget when it comes to international uh, films, which also help us a lot in terms of the co-productions that we create with our money, because we also understand that when you're working with international, it's not about what you can get from them, but it's also about what you can give, which then becomes uh, very important in terms of being able to have equity over your project, and also being able to have ex ex exhibition rights, and also take pride and own that uh, production that has been created. I think recently one of the co-productions that we've just signed was uh, full Paradise with Max Fingers, which we're very proud about, which was the first um, uh, co-production documentary um, that we've signed with the Netherlands, and we're hoping it's the first of many. Um, we're celebrating about 20 years uh, with Canada in terms of co-productions, um, and they've also, like Germany, I think Germany we've had about 58 projects, but also Canada has been one of the first ones that we've had in terms of working internationally, and they've been consistent, I think, but their strength obviously lies in television, and we're hoping that creating platforms like this that um, through Yasmin has allowed us in terms of exchanging not just content but exchanging culture and exchanging about exchanging our views and ideas of how do we take um, the country forward. Uh, one of the speakers from the Swiss um, from the Swiss diplomats yesterday spoke about looking at each other in the eye um, and being able to truthfully and honestly engage one another and I think um, documentary is one of those um, genres and, 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 and language that allows us to engage one another from a statistical point of view, right, to political, social, and seeing how do we mend the walls and how do we bridge the gaps that divide us. Um, and I think we look up to Europe in terms of them being able to fully fund and, and support their their documentary sphere, and we're hoping that as we grow as a country and as we grow as national institutions, that we will be able to get to the next level where we fully fund South African um, films and and be able to support them fully without them having to, if I may use the word, hustle for money. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, obviously, like any other country, um, we do have challenges, and uh, because we have um, a growing industry that is still developing as compared to the rest of the world, um, we also struggle um, to fund um, to find money, rather, to fund films from a private sector, because again, it's still seen as a niche market. But we're working our way to actually getting, and, and, and I suppose in the near future, we hope that the private sector would all not only see this as a social thing, but also will see it as a, an entrepreneurial thing that they can start engaging with us and having conversation and forming our partnerships. Um, also, in terms of um, obviously the the national bodies in South Africa being the one that fund most of the the documentary, the budgets are limited. National governments' budgets are split into everything from social grants right up to economic development, and we constantly are fighting for that space to remain relevant and to show them the input that we actually have because we have a good. Um, 
contribution that we make in the country in terms of tax paying, um, contribution to the gross, um, uh, domestic gross profits and everything. Um, I think also one of the challenges that we have and um, we, we, we're working on is just getting in sufficient money from broadcasters in terms of the word go, because I think we find that um, sometimes it is not accelerated as much as we would want to, um, to have it. But those are challenges that I'm sure other countries also suffer from. But um, from a content point of view, we can stand up with, you know, with our shoulders high and say, uh, we have creatives that are brilliant at their job. We have creatives that are passionate, that give their all, and that are quite an honor and um, to work with. Um, I think I'm just at the one of the last few things. We've spoken about challenges. I think also just, um, um, just to give you a bit of, um, not percentages, but a rough, a rough estimate, I think about 40 to 50 percent of the projects that are actually showing um, in this festival here have been supported by the National Film and Video Foundation. And we're hoping that obviously with everybody that will be hearing the pitches and the proposal, there will be some interest so that we can start building more relationships. Um, in terms of um, marketing, uh, we constantly are trying to find new avenues and uh, platforms to find our content, and which then justifies why we are here today as the NAVF and uh, supporting South African films. Because when we got approached by uh, the Vision Dural, um, we had to make an emotional decision of saying, you know what? we will be part of this because it is a very big milestone for South Africans at this stage to be honored in the Netherlands, because, I mean, no, sorry, in Swiss, because it is an honor uh, <laughs> to be part of, uh, to, be, to be actually be the center of attention, and um, it's, it's a great honor indeed. Um, I think, because um, my other colleagues are still gonna be talking from other, from the, DFA, they will speak more about the incentives because I think they have experienced them from a receiver point of view and um, they won't be as biased as I am. <laughs> but um, I think um, we try and we're hoping to engage and get uh, more relationships from here and um, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yolanta. Uh, I would like to invite here now Pat van Herden and Mark Schwingers. There's a bit, uh, a little change. Uh, board members of the Documentary Filmmakers Association. Welcome. Are you going to stay there, Mark? <laughs> so I'm doing an all star presentation PowerPoint. That's what, how I grew up. But I'm not getting it up. <laughs> Sorry. said she would open it, yeah. Okay, that's the wrong slide. Um, okay, as you all know, we're a partner in bringing a lot of filmmakers and a delegation um, on behalf of the Documentary Filmmakers Association. Mark, did I get that one right? I said federation yesterday, I apologize. But for those of you that were at yesterday's, we're capturing some of the same information. But I want to give you a little insight into what the Documentary, Feder uh, <laughs> Documentary Filmmakers Association does in South Africa. Um, there are a number of DFA board members here. There are a number of document, uh, Documentary Filmmaker Association members here. So if you want to have, uh, I mean, there's Mark over there, there's Jolyn. Who else is here on behalf of the board, Envo? Um, so if you want to get hold of anyone, there are many of them in the room. Um, we've supported a, a, a delegation of 14 people and um, from the Department of Trade and Industry. That's what the DFA um, does. It's a, an advocacy unit for documentary filmmakers. Please get a look at our booklet. There are a lot of projects in there in search of funding and in search of collaboration. 
Um, also meet us at the DFA meeting lounge. Um, we're all available. Just to give you a brief idea of where we are, we're mostly in Joburg office, but we're also in Cape Town and in Durban. That's where we operate from. Uh, we're there to promote the interests of documentary filmmakers. We're 10 years old. We have 170 paid up members, but there are a whole lot of other members that we have that are not necessarily paid up members. We are not for profit organization and, and we're key in cooperation with all the other South African independent um, producer organizations. Um, obviously, our agendas are pretty much the same as the NFEF outlined in terms of transformation of our industry. We're there also as an advocacy unit. In other words, we try and pressurize broadcasters to give slots to documentaries. We recently had that kind of um, exchange with the public broadcaster. We also try and do it with other broadcasters, but we are in a very challenged environment. We also give out information for opportunities for documentary filmmakers. Um, we mentor newcomers. There are many of us much older in the room, and they're younger people, and there's a constant dialogue about their films, about our films. Um, and we try and create a place of sharing information. Um, just to give you some idea of how we're operating in South Africa in terms of the um, pay TV players in South Africa, obviously a large part of that is NASPAS, which owns Mzansi Magic. There are a whole lot of opportunities within that NASPAS group um, there's a local channel um, called Mzanzi that is doing some documentary. There's Mnet that does one or two documentaries. There's some opportunities within that. And obviously, there's a new player on the market called Econet amongst the other group, um, Quasi, uh, which is doing local um, commissioning of documentaries. Um, there's no broad commitment, a commitment to a particular slot, but the DFA does that kind of work. We're meeting with the SABC to try and get uh, re-engage them on committing to a slot that is authored documentary. Um, and it's unfortunate in our environment that a new you know, group of filmmakers who have come out don't see the public broadcast as a, basis of, as a base for support. And it will be the first time in, I don't know, 10 years where that has been the case. It's not your first port of call. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, but it's, you know, I think that we're not panicking. We've panicked and we're getting, I think we're now in a place where things are going to change for the better. Just in terms of the terrestrial TV environment, there's SABC, which is largest. It tracks between 8 million people on, on, uh, on a day on SABC1 on the largest channel. On ETV, you're looking at 5 million figures on some of the dramas. And then there are a whole lot of community TV stations all over. All of these have opportunities for documentary filmmakers. Um, but our, obviously, our largest platform is the public broadcaster. It, is our, it, it, it has a commitment to local content production. It has a commitment to documentary. And the DFA is one of those organizations that need to hold it accountable to providing those slots for author documentary. I mean, most of those author documentary slots are now being taken over by format documentary. And so we need to re-engage the broadcaster on that commitment. And some of the, like ICASA is one of the agencies that makes the um, SABC behave, we need to do, be putting the pressure back on to, to, uh, you know, to get local production back on SABC, I mean documentaries in particular. The other kind of platforms that we need to assert and the, or, or you know, that the Documentary Federation can do something about is Showmax, which is beginning its uh, SVOD program um, and platform, and it is commissioning documentaries. There's Netflix, which, as, as we know, just recently at um, MIPCOM, they announced uh, a huge amount of money that is going towards documentary funding. Um, in fact, it's almost going to match some of their um, drama funding, particularly because of the audience intelligence feedback, which is that people want to watch documentaries. Um, so there are opportunities there, and they're slowly moving into South Africa. Um, obviously, theatre and then Al Jazeera. I think there are a lot of Al Jazeera, South African-made documentaries that land up on Al Jazeera. So we have, it's a challenging environment, but we have lots of opportunities to engage local platforms in order to come into co-productions. Then, um, uh, just a bit with, um, Mark's going to do some of this now. Um, so we have a number of broadcasters um, that we can work with. We have some challenges that uh, we have in the 11 national languages and some channels are very language targeted. Um, so you have to do that kind of homework in order to 
And, and there are various ways that you can operate within that market. Um, I think that, you know, obviously we're in a, in a situation now where the South African government has, has really declared that they want to grow the creative industry. And so there are a lot of facilitating organizations that are trying to create this moment for creative industries. And um, I think, Mark, would you like to come up and talk to... So we're going to talk to the DTI rebate, the IDC, the NFEF, and... Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, so basically, just, just to fill in in terms of um, who these various acronyms are. So regulator, ICASA, stands for the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa. They really are there to, to try and regulate the, the space in terms of the broadcast environment. They haven't been as independent or as as with teeth as we might like in our industry, and certainly we're trying to trying to push to improve that. Um, uh, then, in terms of the uh, space to do production with South Africa, and I think that might be of interest to to many people in the room, we have. As Pat's alluded, several sources of broadcast funding, but the broadcast space in terms of typical documentary has been problematic um, in the last while. We have not seen as much support as we might like. We've got some great festivals uh, in in South Africa who do support documentaries, and Daryl, who's here from Encounters, uh, really runs one of the best documentary festivals uh, to take place anywhere, really. And in South Africa, we're very, very lucky to have such a great documentary festival. So. Um, we also have the uh, Durban Film Market and Durban Film Festival, which happens every year, and they have a very firm support for documentary work as well. Um, so the problem in our space is broadcast, and perhaps that we don't have much in the way of regional funds. We do have regional film offices who do support as much as they can, and in the KwaZulu-Natal or KZN region, um, we do have some money available uh, for documentary, if if a documentary is being shot in that province, um, and uh, in the other provinces, far less so. Um, that's really the one who actually has funding available. Then uh, Pat's alluded to the DTI, the Department of Trade and Industry, who have a, a production incentive. Uh, that production incentive, under formal co-production or under a locally made production, can handle up to. 35% uh, of the uh, of the budget of the South African what they call qualifying spend, so money that qualifies for the production within South Africa. So it's not of the entire production budget; it is only of what you spend in South Africa. But it still goes a long way. If you if you're shooting your entire documentary within South Africa's borders, and you're using South African services and South African people, all of those expenses will qualify and you'll get effectively 35% back on it. And it's possible to get it in milestones so that you'll end up getting payments as you go along. And usually we'll need to have a completion bond in order to do that, but um, the DTR will pay up to 70% of the cost of the completion bond with the very first milestone. Uh, so that reduces the cost significantly. Uh, lands up costing you in the region of around, um, what would it be, no, 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 so that's about, it's only about five to six thousand euros or so uh, for your for your that you have to pay out of pocket in order to get the completion bond in place. Um, the rest is paid by the DTI, depending on your budget range. Um, formal co-productions. We have eight treaties which are currently signed, uh, and sorry, they're up there. Okay, um, and uh, the latest one to be signed was the Netherlands, and I'm fortunate to to be co-producer with a Dutch uh, producer, Peter van Hosting, on, on a production, the first of the documentary productions under the Dutch one, but of course other documentaries have been done. Um, there are complexities in doing any co-production. The process takes a lot more time. It is, it's very um, administratively difficult. Both countries effectively have to um, agree upon the co-production status as a first step and the processes in order to get that through are simply administrative and take quite a while to get to get through the through the workings 
you have to do the budget in multiple currencies and submit it in multiple countries and do necessary supporting documentation. That process itself takes time. Then you've got around about maybe a six to eight week leeway once you've submitted it to your parties in the respective countries for them to approve. And you'll tend to find that the minority country will want to wait for the majority country to, to support before they, before they actually green light the project. Um, and then once that's been done, you can go and apply for the necessary funding in respective countries. So you can go to the uh, DTI and get your production incentive. That process is almost automatic. If you do go under a formal co-production treaty, and there isn't one with Switzerland presently, but we do have with the other countries that are mentioned up there, and certainly um, if one motivates for it, it will eventually happen. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, if, if there's a need and, and, and producers want to do films, it will happen. So that, that really leads to um, uh, a climate where we have a finite pool available. The National Film and Video Foundation, and Yolanda spoke first, do provide um, uh, money towards production. Unfortunately, if you're using it in combination with the, with the production incentive with the rebate, it is repayable, but only if the project ever makes money. And as we know, docs don't often make money. So, so, your, so your chances are that you'll never have to worry about it, but you may have to repay it if your film makes money somewhere down the line. And their position is always very reasonable in terms of that. It's not big money, but it's better money than many of the international funds offer you. So it, it's good to have to, to, to uh, supplement your, your pool. And then, of course, if you have a local broadcaster and if you bring in money and you can qualify on the rebate on that money, why not? Um, it makes perfect sense. So in my picture, I'm minority co-producer, 25%. Uh, the Dutch are majority at 75%. They're bringing money in euros into South Africa to supplement our budget, which increases the amount that the rebate, that 35%, pays out on. So effectively, it actually makes it viable. Most co-production treaties will have a minimum spend for the minority co-producer of at least 20%. So you'll find that if we're involved as South Africa, it tends to be on the whole as minority co-producer because we're unlikely to be able to raise as much money as other countries are, but it can work if the project lends itself to it and if we are shooting in, in the territory. So I don't know if that's answers. I think that's pretty much it, yeah. So, I mean, that's something the Documentary uh, Filmmakers Association does too, which is to disseminate this kind of information. And also, Mark is, ha having done this, is one of the people that the younger filmmakers can contact for this kind of uh, consulting. Um, just to let you know that there are, 200, there are at least 200 production companies in South Africa, and obviously we can serve as a conduit and to give information to producers looking for producers in South Africa as well in the documentary tradition. Um, we are uh, growing. We're probably the hugest youth bulge in the world. In fact, we are. And so you can see that there's a, a very big market, an investment opportunity in the television of the future in in Africa, and in Southern Africa, for us in particular. Um, sharing is caring. One of our biggest, <laughs> one of our biggest um, things in South Africa is if you want to access funding, it's about local content development. Um, and that's a, very, that's a very key part of any co-production, is how is it growing the local industry? And obviously, over and above that, how is, that, how is it then growing a global conversation? Um, I'm just going to move on because we live, uh, just to say that when you come to South Africa, we, we do live in a strange place and they are, it's going to be a very big adventure, but we encourage people to get into co-productions with us and to use the Documentary Filmmakers Association as a conduit for that. And there's a nice, if you want to know about strange places, have a look at that on YouTube. Those are the kind of things that happen to people who have GoPros on their um, vehicles. It's a, and then if you want to get hold of us, we're available at the DFA meeting lounge at just around the corner here, and our information is online under the Documentary Filmmakers Association. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. By the way, if 
there are any questions, remarks uh, here in the audience also concerning the NFVF contribution, please just let us know. We have a microphone also for you, so don't be shy. If not, uh, I would like uh, now just to, we have to set up here another configuration because more people would be speaking uh, uh, now, so we will just arrange the uh, sofa and chairs because uh, mm, now we we go we will leave let's say the institutional point of view whether from the government or uh, not uh, and we will uh, explore a bit more uh, the documentary uh, production uh, in South Africa from a creative point of view, from an aesthetic and historical point of view. I have the pleasure to welcome here G.O.T. Mystery, that uh, is a filmmaker also, but a professor at uh, Wits University in Johannesburg and a film critic. Gioti, by the way, uh, wrote the introduction that you can find in our festival catalog, the big catalog, just uh, at the beginning of the section uh, devoted to the Focus South Africa. Thank you so much, Gioti, by the way, for uh, your contribution, your help, and uh, it was very interesting and constructive to exchange with you. And uh, Gioti will be in conversation also with Daryl Els. Daryl is uh, uh, at the moment the director, artistic director of Encounters, the documentary uh, film festival in Cape Town, but that also takes place in, in Johannesburg. It's uh, his second year, and it's also the second year he comes here uh, to in Nyon. This year, he is also member of the one of the jury, the Swiss jury. So he's we're doing this exchange. We are going into South African documentary, and you are diving into Swiss contemporary documentary. Uh, Daryl used also to run uh, the Bioscope Theatre in. Uh, Johannesburg, so you both have uh, a different, let's say, point of views that would be very, very interesting for this conversation, and I would like to invite you to come with me here up on stage. Yeah, do you think it's better? It's like... Uh, okay, I sit here. I think we should have... Uh, other microphones that were just here around. Jasmine, can we ask people to move forward so that we can see them because it's a conversation? Is yeah, if, okay, yeah, and already to... Comfortable, but we'd love to see you. So yeah, and maybe, I don't know if it's possible just to yeah, reduce, to reduce the light a little bit yeah. here because it's a bit like... Oh, yeah, it's much better. Thank you already, yeah, yeah. So good, thank you. So here we go. I'll be with you, but you have uh, many things to to say and to share. So, shall you, Jati, please? Just let me look at the time so that we have time for questions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rehard, for moving. Okay, so um, my name's Jyoti Mystery, and it's really a pleasure to actually be here. And I'd like to thank Jasmine Bashik. Have I said that correctly? Not more, completely, more really. but it's okay. <laughs> I'm used to it. Uh. Um, uh, for actually the really very engaged conversations that we've had via email, in, and also in kind of thinking through what does it mean to put together um, a project of from 300 films after 25 years of sort of a democratic kind of 
context for filmmaking in South Africa? What does it mean to try and create a selection? So I want to thank you for that because I think this was a, an inordinately large task. Um, so I'm going to say a few things, and I don't want to think about this as a talk on the history of South African filmmaking. I think that would be very dry and unproductive in a space like this where there are so many South African filmmakers in the room. What I thought would be more productive is actually to offer you four moves. And the last two moves in my sort of uh, invitation to think together is really a, a two provocations. So in my, in my first move, what I want to offer very, very briefly is that the history of documentary filmmaking in South Africa is no different from any other sort of history of, of oppressive ideological regimes where you have sort of uh, an ideological framework, which is in, in many ways the history of documentary practice, that governs the way in which documentary practice works, right? So something that is driven by an ideological agenda. You're trying to convince or instrumentalize through the medium. And in many ways in South Africa, this took two forms. There was sort of the propaganda films of the apartheid state that justified and tried to convince locally and internationally the, the rationale for separate development on racial grounds, right? Which in many ways is another way of talking about propaganda films. And I'm going to try and avoid using that term a little bit. On the other hand, you had what would historically be called underground films, which is those, that content which drives and challenges the very formal ideological rhetoric being put out by the state. And in many ways, that served a very highly agitprop kind of agenda, right? So something that is challenging one ideological formal context with underground filmmaking. And of course, for South African filmmakers, uh, two organizations will immediately come to mind, the Video News Service, VNS, which was very important in mobilizing masses, but also bringing to the attention um, to international audiences, the plight of the South African experience, and of course the full Free Filmmakers Organization. So those I want to sort of offer as the terrain, the big ideological kind of documentary film. And then of course if you look at the evolution of the documentary format, very quickly, and, and this word has come up al already a lot in the, the conversation this morning, um, the subjective, right? So we've gone from the ideological to the very far extreme of the, of the development of the genre, and I'm going to talk about this word genre a little bit, um, uh, to telling stories from a very personal perspective. The intimate story, the personal story, you can hear everyone sort of who's ever had to get feedback on their project going, you know, the response you get from a commissioning editor or a producer's, whose story is it? Right, so you know this phrase. And this is really the position of sort of taking the personal narrative and writing it back to the ideological framework. So what shouldn't be misunderstood is I'm saying ideology is always present, it just has another veneer, right? So you write the personal back to, to the political. No different from the expression that we used in feminist rhetoric actually, almost 25 years ago as well, where the personal is political, right? So you see these kind of two big moves. So the first clip I want to, the first clip I want to use is Simon Gush's film, which is actually a non-conventional documentary form, but still speaks to this kind of the idea of the ideology. And his film is called Kelvin and Holiday. And um, I'd like to run that back to back with um, Rian Hendrix's film, Devil's Lair, where you see sort of a filmmaker directly talking about Calvinism and its relation and its ideological relationship to the individual. And then uh, Rian's film, which directly makes reference to the subjective. So shall we look at those two? Thank you so much.
Okay, so, so that was Simon Gosh's film, and then if we could do Rian Hendricks, and then I'll speak to that clip after. Um, so the devil's the devil's uh, lev uh, devil. Wat bloeit er nog bij je? Die bullet zit er nog uit wie vast. Nou kan die bullet niet drijven, hè? Dat zit vast met grijs. Ja, die potje. Die potje. interesting about the medium is having sort of set up this first move of agitprop in relation to propaganda, the discourse around how we talk about documentaries around instrumentalizing has actually shifted to an, a thinking around activism. How do we think about documentary as a medium for social change, as a medium for commenting on like sort of marginal lives, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The way in which we've become quite preoccupied um, with how do we represent those communities, and here's a phrase that you've heard a lot, how do you give voice to the voiceless? How do you represent those that have not been seen in society? The idea that they are communities that require representation. And filmmakers have actually used really interesting strategies that you know, reflect on their moral issues, on, uh, that reflect their own ethics in trying to deal with these, uh, these questions. And here, the, the idea of instrumentalizing and activism really is about shifting the discourse where we really think about now documentary as an encounter, as a way in which subjectivities come into conversation with each other. In other words, the documentary filmmaker being very aware of their own subjectivity, being reflexive about their subjectivity. In other words, I'm not going to claim a truth. I'm neither going to uh, claim any kind of position that is objective. We, will, we would not speak in those terms anymore as practitioners or as, as theorists. Instead, we would recognize the subjectivity of the filmmaker, their own position, either class, race, access, privilege, and that of the community or the individual they're representing. And thus, the subjectivity of the filmmaker and the subjectivity of the participants becomes an encounter through which this medium then finds expression. 
And at Propos the Word Encounter, I think Daryl is the director of a, a very aptly named film festival in South Africa called Encounters. And maybe it's my, um, my opportunity to invite Daryl into what it means to sort of create encounters and, and context for encounters through his programming. And then after Daryl has a few things to say, maybe I'll get to my moves three and four. Thank you. Oh. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Yasmin, for inviting me and having me on the panel. And uh, thank you to all of you for being here. Um, I think uh, as a way of getting to um, uh, this idea of the encounter with audiences and to speak perhaps from the perspective of um, how documentaries circulate and how they are received in South Africa is just to speak a bit about the uh, historical and uh, origins and practices of Encounters as a Documentary Festival, which um, has very definite links to this country, in fact. Um, uh, it was a, uh, I don't want to call it an intervention, but a, a proposition from Prolovetsia in the late 90s uh, to Stephen Markovitz and Nodi Murphy to, uh, with, with the idea to start a, a film festival in South Africa, uh, supported by uh, the, the Swiss Embassy and other cultural bodies, and so, and so, um, <clears throat> with that, uh, in cult encounters um, uh, came to be. In fact, the first edition of the festival in 1999 was called the Swiss South African Documentary Film Festival, um, and the, the the name Encounters, in fact, comes from from Peter Durin, who some of you may know used to work for for Swiss Film. So there's a long kind of uh, uh, history in terms of its genesis in uh, in, in Switzerland. But it was very much the first festival of its of its type uh, to be dedicated to um, uh, documentary cinema. Um, uh, I think the the just to sort of outline maybe some of the impulses that gave rise to the festival. I think it's very much about a repositioning of South African documentary in a number of ways. About uh, the idea of 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 if you read the sort of early program notes, a lot of it is around taking it documentary uh, viewing from the small screen to the big screen, um, the idea of positioning documentary as a, as a creative art, um, as, a, as a cinema. Uh, it's about reframing the, I think one of the central sort of, the, sort of the central ethos of the festival is around reframing the circulation of documentary films, around pr privileging a kind of collective viewing experience, um, encouraging discussions around the films through, through cinema with filmmakers. Um, and very much placing um, South African documentary at that time within a within a global context, um, the idea of kind of bridging, uh, you know, bringing films that audiences wouldn't necessarily have the chance to see international films, for example, but also connecting filmmakers to uh, in, uh, local filmmakers to international practitioners and their content. And I think if you look at the, the kind of way in which Encounters emerges as a festival, it's very much in step with what's happening with other African film festivals at the time, which is really around an internationalization um, of film festival platforms. So the Zanzibar International Film Festival starts in 98. Uh, Durban changes its name under Peter Rovick in 98 and adds the word international. It's very much a spirit of, of a kind of reaching out, in a sense. I think it, 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 this kind of... Um, emphasis on, on connecting the periphery to the center or the problematics of connecting the periphery to the center in a sense. Um, the festival has, since its inception in, in the late 90s, been both a, a site of reception and a site of the construction of audiences, and we can speak a bit more about the problematics of that later, maybe. But it's also been a site of production. And from the very beginning, the, the um, Close Encounters Film Lab was implemented alongside the screening program. Um, and that partnership, which has run, the lab has run um, over the last 19 years. It's had nine editions, and it's produced 48 films. It's very much a um, mode of following uh, the career trajectories of filmmakers. Uh, it's been tethered uh, to interest from local broadcasters. And as a result of that, as uh, Mark and Pat mentioned, with the, um, the absence of a, of a strong public broadcast in South Africa, the lab has struggled in recent times to really um, achieve the kind of output and the kind of influence that I think that it, that it had uh, in, in previous years. Um, and so, uh, y you know, in sort of um, 
painting this kind of quite brief, uh, I think, sort of historical posi positioning of encounters, it's really to uh, come to the question of how has it played a role in, um, in shaping South African documentary film culture over the last 20 years. I mean, uh, I'm quite grateful to, to, for this focus because I think as Encounters, which is now on, its, on the eve of its, of its sort of two-decade anniversary, next year's 20 years, that it's so, it, it stands at a point where it can start to interrogate that. And I think this is something that festivals often don't do. It's to have a kind of reflexive approach to um, what does it mean to, to program South African documentaries for, for 20 years? Uh, what does it, uh, uh, you know, how does, what is the construction of audiences over time? Um, how have those audiences been, how have they been, uh, how have they been built, how have they been developed, how is that tethered to um, questions around infrastructure, which we know uh, in terms of independent cinemas are severely lacking in South Africa. So how does it inform a kind of, a kind of uh, a culture of watching, but also a culture of, of, of aesthetics that has been produced um, with local practitioners? Um, and that leads me to a question around, I think after 25 years of independent documentary production leads to a question of the film canon and, and what is the nature of that canon? How is it constructed? Um, uh, w you know, it, it, this is a kind of, um, it's always a kind of fraught, kind of contested area, I think, in, in terms of um, film studies. Um, and uh, one thing that quite uh, sort of interests me is that in that, in the kind of, uh, process of programming over these years, uh, you know, you really come to this kind of, um, this, w this question around taste making, what does that mean around the cultural politics of that? What does it mean around the, um, the production of knowledge in terms of, uh, of a curatorial approach? And I think that what I would be quite interested in uh, is firstly to, to hear a bit more about your own, Yasmin, your own uh, <laughs> editorial line in terms of uh, choosing the 19 films that are that are uh, selected here. Maybe you can go a bit more in depth into that. Um, and then, yeah, we can continue. Well, as I, as I said at the beginning, uh, again, it's a very difficult task because you are dealing with uh, more years, 15 years. So how and who are you? to choose uh, a, a, a limited numbers of, of films. So it's a very difficult task, but from the beginning, uh, I it's clear that it won't be a complete retrospective. This is not the goal. So you were mentioning the term, the idea of subjectivity, which is extremely important uh, because it is subjective. It is uh, uh, the result of different point of views, so mine and those of my colleagues, that uh, chose those 19 films that are here. Um, and we stand for them, so of course, so objectivity does not exist anyway in cinema and anything, and thanks God, because this is what is interesting both uh, from a, let's say, curatorial point of view, but also what uh, we uh, at Vision du Réel, by the way, what we look in the films we are watching, we want to see the subjectivity of the filmmaker, of the way he tells the story. So it's not the story itself, not only, it's really the way the story is told. This is what is interesting. So this is the the the, what really uh, pushed us in choosing these 90 films that for sure we don't have the pretension to say they are the best one of the 15 uh, last year, but it's an attempt to, uh, as I said, give an insight into the uh, diverse uh, documentary production. Of course, in this uh, exercise, in this process of uh, choosing films, you also have inevitably to kill your darlings. So uh, this was, uh, many murders happened because uh, you have to do it uh, and uh, you have to think also of, uh, of the frame of the festival, the audience try to give an insight of, uh, of the very different uh, approaches that um, 
that we discovered. But if we had uh, more time, more days, more slots, uh, I guess more films would be would be there. So, I you know, the other thing is it's also very, if not difficult, it's always very tricky or delicate. Uh, and this is uh, something I have to face each year, being uh, uh, the focus manager, is to deal, to explore uh, a country, its documentary production, that you don't know that much. I'm no expert of South African documentary, as I was and still am not uh, expert of uh, Chilean uh, documentary, Georgian, Tunisian, so these are the focus that we organized in the past. But again, uh, uh, being clear about it, I'm not really pretending I, I know this territory, but I explore it and I try to share, we try to share what we found, what we thought was interesting with, uh, with the audience. So, so again, um, it's a challenge, it's really a huge challenge and, uh, and I always, we always try to make it clear with uh, the uh, filmmakers of the chosen country as well as the producer institution that it's our point of view, and uh, and again, it's not a matter of uh, saying the truth uh, or not saying the truth. There is no truth, but there is this subjectivity in films we 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 thought would be interesting to share with uh, with our audience, uh, and uh, we're not telling the whole South African history, uh, artistic or uh, um, social or po political with these uh, films and with these projects, but again, it's a glimpse, it's a proposal. These are some proposals, so these are uh, uh, a bit the, the, the challenges that we, we, we try to, uh, to handle. Yeah. So I, guess I guess that gives me an opportunity to jump into the, the, the last two points I really want to make, because you've raised the issue quite importantly around subjectivity form, which I want to talk about, not just what story you tell, but how you tell the story which I'm calling the politics of aesthetics. And I think this is quite a, an important issue actually for us in South Africa. And, and I think when I look at the previous focuses you've had, I would say it's, it's an issue that actually a lot of emerging countries or countries with a particular kind of political history uh, have to grapple with and deal with. And that is this issue of truth and realism and the duality between reality and the, the idea of realism in cinema, which I want to sort of argue for in this context as a provocation now, that in many ways the form the, of the documentary is really now much more in direct conversation as a continuum on, on the level of fiction. And, and that if we really think about this idea of the politics of aesthetics, one of the things we might think about is the way in which ethnographic film, which has a long history on the continent, not just in South Africa, was in many ways used as a vehicle to try and understand a context. In other words, explain a context. And I think what is interesting and important is that there's a sharp move away from actually thinking about the medium as an ethnographic medium. Right? I, th I think that's the provocation I want to offer. And that this idea of trying to capture a reality or a realism is actually in sharp contrast to rethinking the idea of ethnography. And I'm going to make the point in two ways. One, I would like to um, use uh, Simon Wood's film um, Orbis to, to reflect on this kind of move away from attempting to explain but rather to observe in a way that recognizes an elision also on the part of the filmmaker. Um, I want to use a, a fabulous term that Eduardo Glissant uses, which is opacity, when a filmmaker also recognizes what we can't actually get to when we're seeing things. And I'm going to connect a few dots here because they're wonderful, wonderful pieces of writing and interviews actually in our large catalog. 
Um, and uh, uh, one of the, the fabulous filmmakers that is being showcased in this, um, in this um, program, Stephen Breton, offers a really fabulous take on this move away from the filmmaker's burden of an ethnography of a community and the way in which unburdening yourself from this kind of ethnographic realism allows the filmmaker a certain opportunity to rethink the politics of aesthetics of this practice of documentary making. So if we could look at um, Orbis, and then I'll, I'll move on from there to the last point I'd like to make. So some of the filmmakers are in the room, so I'm not going to try and explain their films back to them, but maybe sometimes, you know, we have to indulge ourselves. So maybe I will at some point explain Simon's Wood to him. Uh, <laughs> uh, which would, I think, be quite a charming exercise. Um, but I think the, the, the point that I'd like to make, and which is also made very clearly in Stefan Breton's uh, conversation piece, is this kind of move away from the ethnographic kind of explain, complain activism, but rather to step back and also become aware of the way in which there's an important distancing. And I think in a South African context, this is quite important, where race, class, and gender privileges also play a way, a very important and strategic ways in which you can access communities and, and communities are also held at bay to you. So what does it mean in a very direct way when white filmmakers go into black communities? What does it mean when black filmmakers make films about themselves? How do we invite conversations that, you know, when we use the word reflexive also, and subjectivity, that we not sort of indulging a narcissistic I and I, right? But there's this way in which we negotiate the contract, the encounter between the subjectivity of the filmmaker and sort of an awareness of how that distancing is either a privileged or a reflexive space. Um, and then the last way in which I want to tie these ideas together is again around the politics of aesthetics is also a fabulous contribution in Rossi's um, in, uh, sort of contribution in the Encounters catalog, where he really talks about reflecting on the complexity of realism and truth, but the way in which this also challenges um, our profound understanding of what it means to also recognize the limits of this medium which I think is becoming increasingly important for us as filmmakers, which separates I, us, I want to say, um, from what's going on, let's say, in platforms like the internet. Because in many ways, documentary filmmakers are also in competition 
with the onslaught of all this content that is being generated by people who have things to say. So what makes, what, what is it that makes this medium now particularly relevant at this moment? And I'd like to um, use the opportunity to go a little step further by um, using a quote that I think is really important in this political moment as we're thinking about documentary practices from Jacques Rancier, where he talks about politics and aesthetics. And the quote goes something like this, and I'll be quite pedantic about it because I think it's very dense. He writes, critical art is an art that aims to produce a new perception of the world and therefore create a commitment to its transformation Note that he's not talking about it in judgment terms, whether it's for a better world, safer world, a kinder world. It's really just about changing, producing a new perception of the world, and therefore create a commitment to its transformation. This schema, very simple in its appearance, is actually the conjunction of three processes. And for us as filmmakers in the room, the three processes are quite important to our practice. So this schema is a conjunction of three processes. First, the production of a sensory form of strangeness, which is what I think this medium is about. To take what is familiar and estrange it. Sounds very Brechtian, actually. Second, the development of an awareness of the reason for the strangeness. Why is it strange to us when we think about it in our medium? And third, it is a mobilization of individuals as a result of that awareness. So it's not talking about a mass scale. It's about recognizing that the experience for a film is really about, at the heart, still connecting. What often filmmakers say in public forums, in festivals, as long as I can reach one person in an audience, I feel like I've been effective in what I want to do. So those are sort of the provocations I want to bring together that draw from a very, very substantive catalog with wonderful interviews, and who have very seasoned practitioners also reflecting on their medium. But I think the political climate now to really think about the politics of aesthetics is really an important one in a South African context. Because in some ways, even if we talk about transformation, what we really are doing is transforming also, and this is my fourth invitation now, is we are transforming in many ways, not just the practice of filmmaking, but we are transforming our audiences to also be open and receptive to the provocations, to the invitations, to the tiny bits of inquiry that we are presenting to them. Because certainly the, the joy, I think, of being a documentary practitioner in contemporary practice is that we don't, our films don't have to offer solutions in kind of this very instrumentalized way, the way they did ideologically, let's say, 100 years back but they are ways in which we recognize the nuances of debate in contemporary society and the, com and the complexity of identities that we're all constantly navigating, whether the subjectivity is encoded in race, class, gender, access, privilege, that those things become shapeshifters depending on the context that you occupy. So then the final provocation is how do we invite audiences, and I think festivals are a wonderful way, broadcasters are certainly at the forefront of also changing and constructing the appetites of audiences. But I do think it's, it's quite important for us to, to recognize the moves that are going on in filmmaking. And the last two clips, um, because we are at a festival and I think we should see what we're talking about as opposed to just hearing me talk about them, is to use two very evocative filmmakers films, Atrophy and Umva, which I think are becoming very much part of this register of thinking about how, how would this transformation, how would this experience, this awareness of a, a change of perception look? And, and I think it's not with coincidence that it's coming from women filmmakers and that the women filmmakers are also embodying black women's bodies because on the African continent, the black woman's body has a very precarious and instrumental function. On the one hand, it's used to talk about the powerful black woman, how strong she is, how capable she is, how she's holding the domestic space together. And we have to remind ourselves that black women's bodies on the African continent are the most ravaged. 
They are the site of the greatest violence. And so these two films, I think, come together in Atrophy and Umva in quite a poetic way in looking at the way in which sort of the, an, a, an invitation to rethinking the politics of aesthetics. Thank you. Maybe this is growing up, the compulsory journey inward, spurning the outward masquerade of personality, its rituals, its urgencies, the fleeting spectacle and the famished audience. Every morning I assemble my body in its different parts and varying percentages. Head to shoulder, arm and leg, surprisingly unfamiliar. When I was younger, there was effortless continuity. That's, that's, that's carrying the burden of, of realizing that our childhood was a PR nightmare. I, I am entitled to be absolutely disillusioned by that. What do you hope that the Truth Commission can do for you? What we stand for as a generation is what happens when you've been giving the wrong drugs. What, like the mutation of a no, sickness, sickness. Uh, 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 the, the, if, uh, the mutation of a sickness that's been fed, that's 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 been like been given the the placebos, that's been given the the the, the panados instead of the chemo. So it's like our memories have been awakened, like the trauma that we carry that we carry for other people. Um, potentially the first time you understood that you were black. That, not the one that you remember, the one that you don't. The one that you don't remember because it was something so fucking tiny, so small. But there must have been something in like, I don't know, like you when you were four, you and your own, like your black mother walking through a mall. So I'm, I'm, I think it's where I hand over back to Daryl to maybe talk about the, the sort of this intersection between the real challenge for practitioners and for audiences and programming is, um, and I think Visions to Real also has a really interesting history in how, just looking at the programming of this year, but also the history, is how do you begin to take audiences on a journey of exploration where the documentary form doesn't propose to tell and explain the world, but invites an inquiry together. So I'm, well, I think I'm, I'm done with my <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that festivals as a kind of key points of circulation and of reception are where 
uh, these ideas of the canon or of the kind of uh, the narration of a national cinema, if you like, if you want to use that kind of clunky sort of term, or if I want to use that clunky term, I guess, um, where they're kind of framed and then reframed. Um, and I find it particularly interesting with, with this selection. Uh, I read a, a, a great quote the other day. If, um, I was just reading an interview with a, with a programmer in Canada, and he was talking about uh, the need to, to make the canon strange. I thought that was a really interesting sentence um, an approach to, to, to film curation um, with festivals. And then, you know, just to reflect back on your, on your quotes around strangeness, and I think, and then to look here at this festival and the kind of lineup that's been introduced here uh, of, of South African films. I mean, it's rooted in a particular kind of idea of, of, of nationhood in a sense. And I, and a sort of articulation of that. And these films, uh, for me, are very much uh, the, the type of films that are kind of, I think, cohering into what I would suspect to be a broader um, impulse around film aesthetics that I think Vizier on the Rail has always had at, at its very core. I find it very interesting that there's this moment of reflection in terms of what films are that we're now kind of considering within these kinds of contexts. Um, and also to say that I think in, in saying that and, in, and, and to, to reflect back on your, your observation around this current kind of landscape of production, that, that the challenges to knowledge production, I think, in, in a broader sense in South Africa and I think globally around, you know, especially the, the discourse around decolonization, for example, that, that in that it offers up new f kind of formal and uh, possibilities and narrative strategies in terms of of trying to um, trying to uh, sort of account for the everyday. You know, there's that great Beckett quote um, uh, to find a form that'll account for the mess. And I always think that's a great kind of way of uh, of sort of approaching uh, this kind of thinking in a way. When I read that, I thought, oh, this is a good this is a good sort of uh, curatorial strategy in a sense. Um, but also to fit into that, I think it's when we when we when we speak about these kinds of kinds of questions, it's also to look at and and the changing nature of the landscape is also to look at how other mediums and other possibilities are emerging, so especially in terms of technology or new media, for example. What possibilities open up then with virtual reality? Um, how does that fit into our thinking around non-fiction narratives and documentary cinema in a kind of post-colonial context? So just a few a few thoughts. Yes, absolutely. So, of course, thank you, Jyoti. Thank you, Daryl. Um, are there any question remarks uh, that you would like to share here? If yes, just let us know somehow. Yeah, maybe the f yeah Jyoti was suggesting maybe the filmmakers that. Uh, made some of the films we we showed a bit here if they feel they would like to make a comment or anything this is the moment <laughs> so do it <laughs> please uh, i think there there's a microphone that should come just because we are recording also this session so so here yeah okay Thank you. I'll sit back down. Um, I'm just I, when I look at these conversations, I always so try. So just a bit, Simon Wood, a uh, filmmaker, <laughs> you I directed I made Orbis. Orbis. Yes, um, I was intrigued by you choosing that scene because it stuck really heavily in my mind because my cinematographer was throwing up. <laughs> um, in the car and I had to film it all myself so I, I winced when I watched that because there's lots of moments where it's out of focus and that's because I'm not as good at him as <laughs> filming um, but Orbis was a film that was constructed in 28 days and it was very much a response to the long years of my life that I've given to my other work my other projects and I sort of added up the fact that, that each film was taking me about three to five years to make and I started to panic that I'd only make four documentaries by the time I was 60 at this current rate. <laughs> so I, I went to Amlazi 
and I filmed every day for one month. I chose the shortest month, February, <laughs> so it's 28 days. Um, and I, uh, then we edited for 30 days, and it premiered in Toronto at Hot Docs. So um, I think that's probably a very light <laughs> um, discussion around the film, and I would invite Jyoti to tell me what it's about at some stage, <laughs> maybe over lunch. Uh, maybe I, I would like you t also to tell something that is related to to Orbis and to, s of course, uh, the the films that you chose to uh, screen here, and we exchanged about it in our uh, emails. It's uh, do you see, and this is also for you, Daryl, and for everybody, uh, a shift that is happening uh, concerning the formal approach uh, in a contemporary uh, documentary in uh, South Africa. Mm, again, do you, do you have the impression that now time has come for uh, some of the filmmakers at least to uh, challenge uh, the form, the aesthetics and to explore new or different uh, uh, form to tell stories? I think that for those who had the opportunity to see most of those 19 films, uh, uh, you can perceive that in the new generation uh, there is an additional uh, different, new, uh, challenging way to, to tell those stories from a former point of view. So I'm going to use this as a quote from Rossi because a lot of the people who are commissioning editors are people I like and they're my friends. So when <laughs> you say Rossi, you yeah, mean Gianfranco, Gianfranco Franco Rossi. Rossi. Yes. Um, has a wonderful quote in the catalogue. And he says, the problem with documentary is that we should make sure we get rid of commissioning editors. <laughs> okay, so it's not my quote, but it's a very provocative statement that he's making. And I, I use this as a way to, I want to make a, a shot, and, and maybe, um, you know, the fact that Simon told us the story I think is very important. I read that, how you made that film, and maybe that's why I love it so much. Um, and and, and Daryl will maybe speak to this uh, quite, Im sort of, because he has quite an op opinion about it as well. I think there's, there's a, sh to answer your question, not with a yes or no. I think there's a sharp level at which this conversation takes place because a lot of the films that have the quote-unquote freedom are actually not taking place in formal institutional frameworks. They're taking place in school, um, so it, it's often a graduate film that will be extraordinary, and it'll take a long time before the filmmaker gets a chance to make that kind of film again. Or um, it's a film that gets made in a lab, uh, or in an incubator, um, and then when the, the, the concept of the delivery of what form it should take gets, starts getting affected by who's, who the commissioning editors, where does the funding come from, what format does it look like, and this is not sort of to personalize the commissioning editor. It's really about talking about what I want to emphasize about institutional structures and the way in which institutional structures frame the politics of aesthetics. And I think that's quite an interesting discussion because the political framework determines the aesthetic register at which a film has to be delivered. And I think that that's where I do think for me in my own practice, if I can just say for a moment, because I can't speak for anyone else, I love the opportunity to make big things and little things because the little things is everything that I can control. 28 days, 30 days of shooting, you know, a favor from a friend, uh, the less negotiated anxiety around where's it gonna show, who's this audience for, and somehow there's a different level of pleasure, and I'm going to use the word pleasure because we don't, we're not bankers. So if we're not getting the big paycheck at the end of a financial crisis, which bankers did get, uh, then there must be something or other reason why we do this job, right? So I, I think that's, and I, I'd like maybe Daryl to talk a little bit about that because I do think it is quite important for us to recognize where some of these films are coming from. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll be uh, just a, a 
very brief and a few quick observations. Um, uh, in terms of a kind of uh, aesthetic or formal shift, I would say that uh, having uh, now gone through two rounds of um, encounters, kind of submissions, that it's very much uh, coheres with what Jyoti is saying. I think coming out of certain film, film schools, and in particular the, the, the teaching methodology at those schools through certain individuals, that there is a kind of... Um, there's very much an emphasis on experimentation and on on challenging the sort of uh, the concept of the documentary in a sense. Um, last year, when I when I came to the program, uh, I thought what I saw was that there was a there, there was a lot of um, what was very encouraging was the the short films that were coming through from those kinds of institutions, and so I thought to reposition the short films at the festivals, not to make them sort of stick with a with yeah not a not a sidebar, but to make them quite central and also to to come up with a format, I mean, it's a simple format of just showing a film and then al allowing a young filmmaker to have 10 minutes to engage with the audience as a way of kind of repositioning those types of films um, and to create another kind of audience engagement with the film rather than just having a short experimental South African film play with a bigger international feature and then no one has a chance to, to um, have that kind of engagement. Um, and absolutely, I mean, films are, are, are um, I think, what's, what's quite interesting and it, it maybe has come a little bit later uh, in, in South Africa is the the kind of ways in which the uh, the film economy and the the art economy for lack of a better term can kind of intersect in a way um, I mean and, uh, when you'll see when the program is announced soon but there's a number of of um, filmmakers that'll be at encounters this year that aren't that are using documentary as an extension of, of a of a broader artistic practice and I think, you know, people like Simon Gush, for example, to have them around the festival, I think is quite interesting. And that's actually coming from your selection, that relationship with Simon. Um, so I think that there's, there's, uh, there are certain shifts and certain movements and there are ways to encourage them, but I'm not sure it's a, ho a cost of wholesale um, um, f shift, yeah, we'll move. We have, uh, oh, there is one question and then you really hard. I'm finally prompted. <laughs> the, the, I think there's another way to look at it as well, I mean, w the shift in the aesthetic in the South African documentary landscape, and that's the collapse of TV. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't really have slots anymore, we don't really have commissioning editors, and uh, it means people are making films in a different way. They're, they're, they're freed up from the tyranny of... of of the um, the TV, but it's it's not all good. Um, and I mean, I've looked at your own program here at Neon, and a lot of the films are actually just straight down TV hours. They've shown on TV. They're properly financed by TV, and you've actually you've probably got some. Well, I know f from experience, you've got some decent commissioning editors, and I, you know, I. I would love to uh, indulge myself in the, in the Rossi quote, but I, I believe uh, some of our most experienced film practitioners in the world today are commissioning editors. They've had scores of films go through their hands over a decade or two of practice. And to lose that, and, to, and, the, and I think that's the problem we're facing is it's it's not only a, m a meltdown of certain sort of TV models and hybrid, in our case, commercial and public, but a squeeze on the public broadcasters where we have these controllers put in uh, above the commissioning editors who are trying to determine, you know, gone is the day of uh, audience uh, appreciation. It's all about audience ratings. So but I think they're... We can't throw the the water out with the the baby without yeah whatever the term is. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I mean it's great, but it's much smaller audiences. You know, there's more freedom, much smaller audiences, maybe more individual pleasure for the filmmaker. And again, I think that's the big difference between us and Switzerland. There is no room in South Africa for art for art's sake in, in any meaningful way outside of the universities. Mm -hmm, mm. Uh, there's no money for it. Uh, we have tremendously 
urgent social issues. So f I think the question of form also becomes, um, you know, these th these things are so damn expensive if you're, going to, if you're going to make them properly. At the end of the day, we have to realise that, um, you know, if the, if, if the audience is small, why should public money be going into these, these things, you know? How much do we spend on a film if there's only going to be 500 people watching it at some festival? So, um, so let's it's stop good cinema. And bad. Let's it's stop good and cinema, bad. Rihad. Let's find other jobs. No. Almost. No, no, no. I'm saying there is... We make our films. If you're lucky enough to make your film in the way you want to make your film, without too much TV pressure, that's great. Then we deliver their version for them. Um, but how many people uh, in South Africa or in places like South Africa around the world are able to do that now? Um, you know, so they just produce a film for a, fe a film festival and uh, be happy with that. I mean, do, should we... Should we allow ourselves to say, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, I think this is a discussion that can be developed also because what are the new and how do, audi how do you find where are, who are the audience today? Wow, this you, you open a, a huge door, which is very, uh, it's an important uh, issue, but uh, you have to go deep into it. Pat, you wanted to say something? Just to wrap up because we have to go on. Just hold on, sorry, the microphone because of the radio recording. It's a conversation we, c we all have and it's, a, it's nice that we have it a, a, a time here, but we should continue it in South Africa. I mean, I wear two hats, I'm a broadcaster and I, and I try to make stuff on my own. And, you know, when you talk about institutional framing and how that formats the, way w the language that we have to use, it's always it's always interesting when that comes about because it's not an institution that's you know deinstitutionalized from society. It's not a separate entity. The horror of being a commissioning editor on a broadcast side is what people want to watch. So when you put out a whole lot of things, and one of them is a beautiful authored documentary with implicit subjectivities and you know reflexivity and all the rest of the beauty, and no one watches it, and then you have a mass audience on formatted documentary. And that's, the, that's where your broadcast money lies. So the institutional framing is actually an audience-centric choice because of a profit, you know, being a profitable broadcaster. In fact, when it goes the other way, it's when you, don't, when you have the money to not be profitable. So the old s statement, what your audience want to watch, is the scariest shit being on the other side of the table. It's like, I, I, I actually cannot believe it sometimes, the big hitters uh, when you put stuff out on a channel. So that's the one thing. And then I think that sometimes we get into a kind of fetishization of the, of the genre <coughs> and, 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 and we miss the political moment. And the political moment to me in South Africa is why have we been usurped in terms of an intellectual conversation about where we are. Take, for example, a show like Inside Job. In, after the financial crisis. That's not an implicit subjective, I mean, you're, you, the subjectivity is, is political, but it's not subjective in terms of the personal. And it's an argument, an exposition documentary about what the hell happened and how can we see it and how we can prevent it happening. And when we begin to fetishize, you know, the, 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 the author, the subjectivity, the sort of morass of our personal dealings, there's a missing moment in South Africa, and it's an intellectual assertion of what's happening. And it seems to me the response to that at this point in time is exposition, actually. What's going down here? How can we explain this? How do we get out of this? And alongside that, not to dismiss the subjective and the beauty of documentary filmmaking that we've seen, those ha it's not a, a squashing of that, but it's to rise to the political moment in the same way that when personal narrative documentary came about in South Africa, it was to say, we are no longer we, we can say I, because we were part of a broad struggle. It was a particular contextual political moment that evolved. And for us to like <coughs> move forward now, it seems to me, what is the political moment? What is required of us as committed people in the country? And it's not necessarily a response that is at that level of, of verifi rarefied um, sort of creative documentary. I don't know. I'm just... Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have to...
And this conversation, but this conversation can be continued later. We do not have time. I'm so sorry. I know I have this also ugly role, but you know. Uh, thank you. But we have the opportunity to discuss more. And I think that this has to be done here in Yon later during our lunchtime in the afternoon and of course you uh, back in South Africa or in the frame of other festivals encounters for instance uh, so thank you very much Daryl thank you very very much Gioti and thank you and uh, now the last step and a uh, very interesting moment uh, of this first part of the focus talk. Uh, we have the pleasure to welcome Carlo Matavane, who just freshly arrived uh, from South Africa this morning. So, Carlo, please uh, come here and join me here on the stage. So, Carlo Matavane. Um, is a very well-known South African director. Uh, your film, Nelson Mandela, The Myth and Me, was screened yesterday evening. Uh, very good screening. I can tell you, you, uh, you could not be here because of your other duties. You are among the most busy men on earth. Uh, but because you're doing many, many things, of course, you're a documentary filmmaker, but you are also a feature drama filmmaker. and this moment you're editing your new films. We met many, many, many years ago when uh, I showed you one of the series that you directed here uh, in Geneva. Yeah, yeah, you forgot, you see how it is. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah, so this just to tell that you are very, very uh, active and you, you have this ability to switch uh, from uh, in different genres and worlds. So this is uh, great. And thank you so much for finding the time to come here uh, in Nyon. We are very happy about it. And the reason is because uh, uh, your film, uh, Nelson Mandela, is for us a very interesting example of co-production. So as I said uh, uh, in the beginning, and it's one of the important points of this focus, it's uh, the projects that uh, we uh, selected. Uh, the focus uh, has the goal to uh, encourage international co-productions between the country that is invited and the international uh, producers, uh, commissioning editors, uh, funds, etc., that are uh, attending the festival. And your film is a very interesting example of this because uh, because it's a co-production and it's a very um, big one. It's South Africa and Germany mainly, but not only. There are many, many countries uh, involved. And I wanted you to tell us about uh, a bit more about it. Uh, not too much to go you know, into specific technical details, but how it is, how it was for you to um, develop this uh, specific uh, structure. Doing a co-production is... Uh, sometimes very often necessary because of budget, because you need money to uh, to make a movie, but sometimes can get also very, very heavy, depending on uh, the situation, depending also on the numbers of country, because I said you had South Africa, Germany, but there is also Nigeria, India, the UK, France, USA, and Sudan that are involved. So it's a lot. And yeah, I would like you to ask you to share a bit more this experience. Um, it's so many years. It feels like so many years, so I don't remember everything now. I try, when I make a new film, I try to forget about the last one because the pain is always so much when you're making the film. So you try to kill these experiences and memories and to move on um, just in case you turn into salt like some biblical figure. So um, I'm going to try to, as I'm getting old, my memory just starts disappearing, so, but I'll try to remember. Um, but I think, you know, um, it's interesting because 
filmmakers have this idea that money should be free. I find it ridiculous. I mean, because life is a constant negotiation. In life you negotiate whether it's romance, whether it's sex, whether it's politics, whether it's everything else, and why shouldn't people negotiate when it comes to raising money or making films? It should be, a, it's, life is a, it's about constantly negotiating and constantly in, in constant battles. You know, I think filmmaking is, is, is like war, you know? Some kind of intellectual, philosophical war, if you want to say it. Because, you know, you could... And I, for a while I was thinking, why are all these rich black South Africans not wanting to invest in films, but they invest in soccer? You know, because the guys just kick the ball. You know, if you give Rihad money and you're a billionaire, he's going to criticize you afterwards, you know, and call you a capitalist and all those things. So, you know, it's normal that these guys are afraid of cinema, they're afraid of film, they're afraid of documentaries. So, but I think, you know, when we, we did, um, we, when we started, actually, and uh, there's a myth uh, from my friends that, we managed to get money easily, and actually it was one of the most difficult projects to get raise money for, um, simply because everyone we went to said they had a Mandela fatigue. Mm. They said, what is it that you can tell us about Mandela that we don't know? And, you know, and I think the world doesn't care about a black experience, a black voice, no one cares, not, not South Africans, not internationally, I think, most people don't care. So I often laugh when I hear my friends saying, oh, you did it and you managed to get money quickly and whatever. And actually, I remember the first time I sent out, the proposal was finished with the budget and everything else. And we sent them in the evening and in the morning, we had, just before 10 in the morning, we had about six rejections, you know? And then we started thinking about how to do it, actually for a while. For about months we thought the, the documentary wasn't happening anymore. And um, BBC, which <laughs> became a partner in the, in the documentary, rejected it, I think, a record of like a couple of times, actually. Um, and so, it, it, you know, everything that you do, I find that everything that you do, it's so difficult to get money for, and whether you get money from, I mean, even when you get money like this fiction film that I'm, I'm finishing, some of the money you get in South Africa, those people who give you the money also have their own issues, their own agenda, their own whatever. So the onslaught is not just the outsiders that you're doing co-production with. The, the onslaught is whoever is giving you money, because unlike being a surgeon and and a scientist, everyone thinks that they can make films. And um, everyone thinks that this is the kind of film that you should make. Sometimes it's driven by serious political agenda, sometimes it's just ignorance, sometimes it's just that it's art and everyone thinks they're artistic. You know, so it's not as malicious as filmmakers think sometimes everyone is out to get them. Sometimes it's just simple, you know. Um, so it's a, it's a combination of factors. And then I started thinking, how do we move forward? Because the, the, the documentary wasn't moving for months. Um, and I kept on getting the same responses of this, we've done Mandela, oh, we've got archives, hey, we, he's dying, and then we have sent a team to South Africa, you know? So it was very, it was very complex. But eventually I came up with this model, which, was a, which I thought worked for, for the form. One was, because firstly, the idea was I, I wanted to make a documentary where I asked a whole lot of people from around the world about Mandela because I felt like he, you know, lots of people around the world claimed him. So, so it, initially it was that it, wasn't, it had nothing to do with financing, actually. Nothing, zero to do with financing. And one of the things I did was to say, we're going to have, um, we're going we're gonna to raise money in a way that, for example, if I wanted to shoot something in South Sudan, then I look at who finances South Sudan, who's interested in South Sudan, like Western countries, then I tap into that, you see. 
So then they finance, they don't finance the whole form. You're asking them to finance legs of the form. So what happens is that I went to Spain and I managed to get money in Spain just to finance the Spanish part. You know, so I came up with this model one night. I was like, oh, this is becoming so complicated uh, because people don't want to finance something that has got nothing to do with them most of the time, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so we, I started breaking it down and said, okay, this is the country, so I want to go to Nigeria. This is how, where, sh where I should get money because I can't get money in Nigeria for the, f for the thing. And um, actually the Gute Institute ended up giving me money Part of it Nigeria, part of it South Sudan, um, you know. So I, I, I started targeting a whole lot of people, mm -hmm. and that's why there's a lot of there's a lot of um, funders on it. Um, but I think the breakthrough came when we did um, a promo, mm -hmm. because with the proposal everyone was saying no, no, no. Mm -hmm. Then we did like a. Promo for a promo reel, like a yeah, teaser or like, something? No, it was like 20 minutes. Okay. It, was, it was very rough, actually. It was not even well cut or anything else, but it was just a, a promo, 20 minutes. And, that, and what happened is that once BBC said yes, mm -hmm. it changed a whole lot of things, actually. Once I had that letter that I put together and I said, BBC is doing it, and the funny part about the German co-production, which brought most of the money, was that I had um, Christian who runs the company in Germany. I was at it five years ago with, and um, I ended up talking to him and he wanted to go out and everyone else wanted to go to sleep. I ended up going out with, hanging out with him. And we sort of kept in touch. And when I was struggling to get the money, I said, you remember I stayed with you the night when everyone wanted to go to sleep. <laughs> Can you owe me, you owe me something. <laughs> I said, uh, I said uh, would, you, would you come on board? So, um, and, and it, was, it, was, it was perhaps one of the most difficult deals that ever happened in my whole career because he wasn't convinced, completely could not convinced. I remember it, um, we went for one year where we couldn't get the money from him. He, wasn't, he was just like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it, yeah, you know. Then eventually I said, okay, let me take the fight to him. So I, um, I called him just before New Year's. I said to him, Christian, this is the last time I ever call you or contact you about the phone. And you're going to tell me before New Year's whether you're in or you're out and I can keep on moving. <laughs> And obviously my producer, Carolyn, my business partner was a little bit like, be a little bit diplomatic, but I felt like I needed to do that, you know, in order to know whether I'm getting the money or whatever. And eventually it ended up being like an amazing co-production with him. And, it, and actually on the fiction film he came also, we got a bit of money in Germany. It's, you know, it's ended up being friendship and everything else in the process. Um, so that has worked very well. Um, the BB site was tough. <laughs> you know, Nick is always tough. <laughs> you, know? Uh, he, you know, he knows South Africa. He has very strong points of views. Actually, with the first time I went to, <laughs> the first time I took a rough cut, I went to Berlin to show a rough cut. It was early in the morning. There were a couple of other funders in the room. And he was sitting there writing on a piece of paper. He was the only one who was writing like a lot of notes. And he kept on saying, bullshit. Nonsense, <laughs> like throughout the things. And I was sitting there in the morning, it was cold in Berlin, and I just arrived that morning. Yeah. And the, f the last thing I wanted to, the, first, the, the last thing I wanted to hear was like, bullshit this, bullshit that. And he was like that in the room. And I was worried that psychologically it would work on other funders. Yeah. That was my biggest concern, you know? So I was trying to find a way to sort of like, um, and I was, I was quite, I think I did, I think I, I did something naughty. I asked someone to, go, to get me a shot and put it in a cup of coffee <laughs> because I was so traumatized <laughs> during the thing. But we did, but, but the thing is, once, once Nick came on board, it really helped um, with, in terms of everyone else and... Like, like and, giving credibility or... And giving or, credibility yeah. and everything else, whatever. And of course, we got money from NFVF. Um, and we then I tried to get money from SABC, 
But and when they saw the promo, they a little bit were thrown off. And I remember going to show it to someone at SABC, and they were like a little bit thrown off. And then I took it to another TV station, ETV. They never came back to me. But to the SABC's credit, they actually screened the film um, after it was made two years after Mandela had passed on. Um, the, one of the things they th said was that they they wanted more time for the family to finish, you know, sort of mourning period mm -hmm. before they could screen it, uh, which is understandable. Um, but I think, you know, um, it's so difficult. I mean, I've been thinking all my life, how do you, I mean, I don't know whether there's a film that's easier personally, maybe for other filmmakers, the experience is different, where there's a film that's easier to make in relation to another film. And I think all films come with their own burden. All films come with their own pain. All films, I mean, in the middle of this fiction film, I said, I'll never make films again. I mean, I was, I've been so traumatized making this film. Um, and the South African money has been the problem, actually. Um, uh, but it's fine, they know the people who are involved that I told them that. So it's okay, I'm not gossiping. Um, <laughs> now I'm not talking about NFVF. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, um, I think because, and it's a very simple thing, it's not even malicious, it's a simple thing, like they, they watch Moonlight and they go like, make it like Moonlight. Yeah. You know, so it's not like even malicious, it's not like bad, like thing. And then the other day they watched uh, Martin Scorsese film. Then they go like, oh, did you see what Scorsese did? Can you do that? You know, uh, you know so it's a, it's a whole of what's in, you know. Uh, whatever is like happening at that moment, they want, they want me to do that. So, so that's funny, you know. Um, but we, we, one of the problems I think happened with the, with the German thing, one of the issues I had with the German thing was that I mean, there was, an, there was a bit of expectation for me to, f for me to film in Germany. Mm -hmm. And that I struggled with because when I conceptualized the, uh, the documentary, there was, I didn't have Germany there, really, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then I sort of started thinking about how to Include in, it or to find include it, include it, and and the beginning and because of the budget, because they saw how much money they were giving in relation to everyone else, it gave them like a bigger say, mm -hmm. you know, which is always a problem with I think co-production that if you have one person or one company, whatever, which I'm learning, when you have one company or one person or one thing that giving so much money almost double of what everyone is giving or triple what everyone is giving. Somehow, when they look at the budget and look at all the contracts and others, they feel the need that actually they matter more than everyone else. Mm -hmm. and, 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 it's, and it's fair. Why would you get money in Germany and not have something that's German? It's fair. I mean, just think about it. A, a Senegalese filmmaker comes to South Africa, goes to the NFVF and say, give me money, I want to do a film about some Senegalese hero that has nothing to do with South Africa. I mean, what would be the reaction? You know, it's, it's fair. So my, my thing is that these questions, these issues, shouldn't be issues that terrify us as filmmakers. You know, it should be issues where we try to find ways to maneuver and creative ways to maneuver because you always lose something. Even if you say, let me be radical, I've done low budget films. I started doing like low budget films. I started doing like films which, with no money. I can tell you, it's not better there either. You know? Um, um, it's, uh, and some person, I mean, I remember I did, a, I did a, a low budget documentary and they were trying to screen it in Denmark and the sound was so bad and they, you know, what they were giving in relation to me fixing the sound was like not worth it, you know? So you, you are constantly in that also. You are like, even when I did conversation on Sunday afternoon, even though I did it the way I wanted to do it and it's the only film I think I did the way, even almost this one also, the fiction film, I think I've done it the way I want to do it. But what it takes from you it's so much, 
because you are back either you are doing conversation on a Sunday afternoon then you do three or four things to pay the rent that you hate and people don't see that but it, that, that eats your soul that eats everything else so for me there is no way out of it in a simple manner it's not us against the system us against the capitalist us against maneuvering the capitalist it doesn't exist you know so even if I go and do commercials, which I did to, <laughs> in between to, to support myself in relation to the stuff I wanted to do, I hated all of them. You know, I was doing a testic rice, you know, rice commercial once, and my grandmother was dying and she died while I was doing it. It was one of the most humiliating experiences, more than any other form I've done. And while my grandmother was dying, they, they, uh, the client kept on saying, um, the rice in the plate is not straight, it's not standing straight enough. And we spent two days in post trying to fix the rice while my grandmother was dying. I don't know. I don't know the easiest way to get out of it, you know? Um, maybe I should do a musical or whatever, <laughs> you know, a horror movie, whatever, all those kind of things. But, but I think in a way, you know, I don't know. But, uh, I think for me, I also think that... W I think it was Kubrick who said it, so don't hold me to it, that the enemy of an artist is when they have complete and limitless power and they have no restriction. And I think it's true, because we have to struggle. I mean, just think about the, the, the people, your family, the people that you date, the people that you marry, you know, the, your friends, it's all a struggle. And I think filmmaking, there's nothing wrong with filmmaking being a struggle as life is and trying to find solutions like you try to find solution to your own life, to your own country which has got political disasters or whatever, you know. So for me, I'm, I'm fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. I think this was uh, also very precious for the... Uh, project teams that will be presenting the project later because uh, some of them have more experience, other less, but uh, it's a way really to be aware of things and to be aware of the challenges. I think this is the, the right way to see it and I like it very much how you you have enough sense of humor, irony or something, I don't know how to call it, but yeah, let's face things, nothing is simple, but take out the interesting and yet challenging part even of these uh, difficulties and, uh, and uh, obstacles sometimes, especially if you have then results such as your films. So thank you very much, Carlo. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll be anywhere, we'll be uh, around. Now I would uh, suggest and invite you to have a short coffee break and then to come back uh, in 15 minutes, five, uh, five minutes, it's reduced now, uh, for the five amazing project presentations. And again, thank you so thank much. You.